my prayer abundantly for a white Christmas and a white New Year. I'm still sore from shoveling snow. Uh, I don't even know what day it was. That was, that was concrete. That was heavy stuff. Well, I don't want uh, the young people, I want you to stay here just for a, a couple minutes. It's, it's the end of the year, and this gives me an opportunity before I preach to you this morning. I want to just take a few moments to kind of wrap some things up and tell you where we are. We've talked about a lot of things over the last, uh, probably the last four months, talking about our vision for this generation now. And now we're coming, this is the last Sunday of the year, Jim. It's hard to believe, isn't it? The last Sunday of the year. Do you remember the first Sunday what I did? I had my pie up on the screen. Remember the pie? People got sick of pie after I don't know how many weeks. Actually, I had a couple of them that I used in the first half of the year as, as an uh, illustration for my messages. But that's where we started uh, uh, the year 2012, and here we are with the last Sunday looking for... Uh, a great year. I see this really as a new start. You know, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. <clears throat> I remember before we built this building, we were back at 1039, and we had several business meetings that we uh, met and we voted on what we were going to do over probably a couple year period, maybe even three years, had several meetings. And I remember questions and answers, and one evening, someone asked me this question. They said, Pastor, what if we don't sell 1039? What if we don't sell 1039? And my response to that question was, I don't even want to think about it. That was my, that was my response. Well, I had a lot of time to think about it, didn't I, over the last five years, and I did, but you know, um, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. There's no doubt in my mind if that affected me these last five years, it certainly affected a lot of other people in our church. And I want to say this. I know we're probably missing some folks that need to hear this because of the snow this morning. Maybe they'll be at the next service. But I want to thank you and I want to commend you for staying by the stuff. There were times when it was uh, discouraging. It really was. When we thought we had a buyer and we were talking about when's the closing date and then the deal fell through. And that happened more than once during those times. In fact, I went on a missions trip one of those years thinking that we would close while I was in Africa uh, at the Kafula Fuda Mission. And when I returned from that trip, I found out that the deal had totally, completely collapsed and we were starting all over again. Well, anyway, thank you to all of the people that stayed with us through all that time. I'm sure there were people that probably got discouraged and thought to themselves, you know, I don't think we should have ever done this. We should have never built this building. We should have stayed put. And we should have stayed at 1039. I mean, it served our purposes and uh, I understand where people are coming from. People are human, kind of like the Israelites when they went out into the wilderness or when they faced the Red Sea and they thought, you know, it wasn't all that bad back in Egypt now that we're facing drowning or execution at the hands of the Egyptian army. But Moses did what he was supposed to do. He led God's people. They went through the Red Sea and they ended up ultimately coming to the Promised Land. So... But thank you for the people that had the vision, the stick to to stay with it, even though you may have been discouraged, and even though you may have had a voice, somebody in your ear, saying, you know, you ought to drop out. You ought to quit. You ought to go someplace else. You know, that's a huge burden that they've got laying on their shoulders. And I wouldn't be surprised if the church goes under. I'm sure that there are people that thought that. There might even been a couple people that even wished that for whatever reason, uh, I don't know. But thank you for all of the people that stuck by this stuff during that time. That's the first thing that I need to say here this morning. We're coming to the end of the year. We've talked about this generation now since the middle of September. In fact, Sunday, September the 16th, 
was the day that we revealed the vision for our church, the new vision for First Bible Baptist Church. <clears throat> now, we stand at the edge of actually, now we've done a lot of preparations, but we stand at the edge of actually moving forward. So let me uh, share a few thoughts with you that you all need to know, and I get more people on Sunday morning than I do any other time. First of all, our life groups. I want to encourage you to become part of one of our life groups, one of our home Bible studies. We have over 500 adults and 170 children that are, have signed up. We've got over 700 people right now that have committed themselves to 35 home Bible studies or life groups. We are going to begin these life groups. Are, they're going to get off the ground in just a couple weeks. So you still have time to sign up, I believe, up until... Uh, actually up until next week or the following week, but I want to remind you of that. You can sign up as you exit this morning. I also want to remind you of our uh, offering envelopes for this generation now. You'll see lots of these this year, everywhere. My goal is to get participation more than accumulation, really is. I know if we can get the whole church behind this, that we will be successful. That's really the key to getting anything done. It's not one person or just a group of people that get behind, a small group of people that get behind a vision, but when you get everyone in the church thinking in the same direction and doing something to contribute to accomplish that, that's when things become successful. So participation is more important than accumulation. And what I mean by accumulation is the dollars themselves. So what I'm asking people to do is get one of these envelopes. There's thousands of them, tens of thousands of them that will be made available. You can get them at the information center. You can get them at the welcome centers. We will put them everywhere so you can pick one up. And I don't care if you put a quarter or a dollar in it. I just want you to think I want to be part of what's happening. So you've heard this before. I want to encourage you. By the way, last week, the offering, we had, we had a great uh, offering for a Christmas offering to kick this off. And I want to thank everybody that had a part in that. Now, for this, uh, for this generation now, today this is something that you can take with you. It is, again, out on the uh, uh, information area. It's actually on the railings behind you all across in between the two sections here. This card is a giving project information card. You're asking the question, what is this all about if you haven't been around here? This explains what the giving project is on the front and on the back, the specific things that we are trying to raise money for. What we are doing, essentially, if I could sum it up in one word, and I can't, but if I tried, I'd say, or one phrase, it would be, we want to finish the building that we started back in 2004. This will be the ninth year, uh, coming into the ninth year of building this building, and we have the smallest portion of it yet to finish. We were unable to do it initially because we didn't have the commitments financially, so we cut the project at a certain point. That was a wise thing to do. Now that 1039 North Greece Road is bye-bye, and the commitment we had to continue sustaining that building and everything that goes to it, now we can move on into the future. This explains what we are raising the money for on the back, and this gives you the philosophy of why we are doing all of this. So what is this card for? This is a reminder. I want you to take it, and I want you to put it in your Bible. You can use it as a bookmark. You can refer to it often to remind you why we are doing what we are doing. A card that looks very similar to this has been made available for several weeks now. Some of you have filled this out and turned it in, and this is a commitment card. And we've dubbed this Commitment Sunday. We want everyone to take one of these and think over what will you do personally to help. I got two cards last Sunday, uh, the first two that came in, 
and the two people that turned them in committed $37,000 to this. I was kind of overwhelmed by that. But the people put their name on it. I know who they are. And then they filled this thing out, and they said that the, between the two of them, they were committing an awful lot of money to this project. And of course, it's over a five-year period of time. But you can, you can commit to one year. You don't have to fill in all the blanks. You may say, you know, I might be living in Arizona a year from now. I don't want to make a commitment beyond what I know reasonably that I'm going to be here. But these commitment cards are also out there. I would like you to take this, and between these two cards, you can couple them together. This is what it's all about, and this is what we are asking you to do. I'm going to ask you to fill it out. If you're uncomfortable putting your name on it, I understand that you don't have to, but if you would, I, it's probably better for you. When I put my name on something like my home mortgage, uh, I kind of felt committed to pay it every month, if you know what I mean. When I bought an automobile and I uh, signed a, for a loan on an automobile, the bank said, could you sign for this? Would you put your signature on there? We just want to make sure that you really mean what you're talking about. I had no problem doing that. And I will have no problem putting my signature on a card like this. So there's two of them. Please don't get confused. They do look similar to one another, but one is an explanation of the giving project, the philosophy behind it, the dollars and where we're going to spend it and finishing the building. And then this is a commitment card. We'd ask you to give this back to us. All right, I'm taking care of my paperwork. Now there's one more thing, and this may be the most shocking of all. This may be the most distressing thing that I have to say this morning. Are you ready? Everybody seated? Hang on. All right, watch now. I've, I've revealed this to a Wednesday night crowd already, and most of them survived. Starting next Sunday, we're going to ask you to fill out an attendance card. I'm just looking. No, we don't need, do we need 911? Anyone want to call emergency right now? There's some, I see a little bit hyperventilating going on out there right now, but are you okay, Bob? You going to make it? Okay, Barb, let me know. If he goes down, let us know quickly. He's got four minutes and he's gone, a goner. Anyway, but uh, th there's the card right there. Now you say, what in the world are we doing this for? Bear with me, there are several good reasons. One of the things that bothers me and probably bothers many of you is that in a church this size, it's easy for people to fall through the cracks. How many of you would agree? It's easy for people to come and go and no one really notice that. That bothers me. What, by not addressing that is a problem. That is, people come and then they go. Essentially, what we are saying to them is, we really don't care. Hello? You understand what I'm saying? And I do care. So we need to do something about that. So this card, this will be part of your bulletin. This card will, you'll come in and one time we're going to ask you to fill it out, the whole thing. The next time, all you have to do is put your name, if you're a regular attender, your name legibly on this, legibly, so we can read it, and then we have your name and we have all your other information. But this will also serve to help us with first-time visitors and second-time visitors, because we have a plan that we want to follow up with those people and make sure that we can make them feel welcome and, uh, and that they're at home, and that we really care that they've come to visit with us. This is what I see. I see a visitor at our church is a gift to First Bible Baptist Church. And when a visitor comes here, it is our collective responsibility to make that person feel welcome. I said collective responsibility. Now, I'll be honest with you, we don't act that way all the time. There are many of you that take that seriously, but many of you do not. 
you feel like, well, I don't need to welcome anybody. I'm here. I heard the message. I was in the worship. I got my donut and my coffee. And then we walk out the door. But we never feel like it's our responsibility to make visitors or guests or people that we don't know make them feel welcome in our church family. We want them to feel that way, and we want to follow up on them. So this card, it's going to be a very minor inconvenience. At first, some of you won't know what to do. I know this is, this is a change. Pastor Grace, I don't know how I'm going to handle this. Do, do I have to get some kind of therapy? Do I have to see a psychiatrist or psychologist to be able to handle this new change in my life? I don't think it will be that traumatic for most of you. Some of you, see me. I'll get you some counseling. But for the rest of you, just think about filling it out one time. If you're a regular attender or member, you fill it out one time. And then every time you come, do that. And then we know that you were here. And we're going to track this. If we don't get a card from you for three or four weeks, maybe you have a problem. Maybe you're sick. Maybe something happened in your family. Maybe there's something we as a church family can do to help you and aid you through a difficult time if we see that you're not coming. So we are asking you to help us help you. Now, you say, Pastor, this is creating work for me. You think it's creating work for you? What do you think this is doing for me right now? This is creating a lot of work for us as a staff, but we're willing to do it to accomplish the intended goal in N. That is to be more responsible with the people who call First Bible Baptist Church their church. We want to minister to you. We want to help you. This is, we're going to call this, or we do call it, a communication card. There's much more. There's an opportunity for prayer requests. There's, there's other things that will be on here that will give you an opportunity to communicate with us. And every one of these will be looked at every week to see if there's something we need to do to help you. Hello. It's creating more work for me than it will for you. I, uh, trust me. But I feel this is my responsibility. Our responsibility is a staff to the family at First Bible Baptist Church. So I'm asking you to help us do that. If you choose not to fill this out, I, uh, the unintended consequence for you is simply this. If, we, if you don't show up and we don't miss you, please don't be upset with us. We're trying to eliminate that as much as we can. Now, I've said this, and this may be a little bit cold over the years, but it's factually true, and that is this. You know, if you don't come to church and no one misses you, the reason is that no one misses you. I know that's simple, but I want you to think about that. If I didn't show up this morning, and when Jim walked down and the offering was taken and nothing happened here, what would you do? You'd start looking around and say, well, who's going to speak this morning? Well, where's Pastor Grace? The reason is, is that I've accepted a responsibility, and you expect me to fulfill that responsibility or make sure that somebody else takes my place if I'm not going to be here, right? Is, I mean, isn't that the simple truth of it? When you accept responsibility at First Bible Baptist Church, let's say you're going to be a Sunday school teacher of four-year-old children. If you don't show up on Sunday morning, you are missed. You are missed because you have a responsibility and there are people looking for you and you didn't show up so people will wonder what happened to you. But when you have no responsibility, when you just walk in, sit down, and walk out, if you don't ever come back, the chances of you being missed are much less than someone who accepts responsibility. Doesn't that make sense? So that's all that we're asking. We want to be responsible with all of the people that come to First Bible Baptist Church, whether they're first-time guests, second-time guests, or you've been here 40-plus years we want to make sure that we're communicating with you, that you have a means to communicate, and we are tracking your welfare and your well-being. So, 
I know it will be a change. We've never done this in 46 years. It's going to be a change, I know that, but it will be a good change ultimately. It'll take a little bit of inconvenience up front, and in the end it's gonna produce, I think, great dividends and results for our whole church. All right, those are, I, I needed to say those things today. It's the end of the year been a fast one, hasn't it? It's gone by very, very quickly. Over the last several weeks, we've been talking about looking up. This is, these are the last messages that I want to bring prior to the beginning of this generation now. Next week, we're going to begin our uh, giving project. We're going to begin this generation now. We're going now. We've done a lot of preparations, but our family, our, our life groups are going to begin, and many other things have already started. And of course, as I said, the giving project will begin. We must be, and we've used this term many times, we must be a vertical church. All of our efforts will be wasted, will be meaningless if we do not have, as a church, a worshipful relationship with God. If this is just a club, if this is like going to Ridgemont Country Club, Oak Hill or Locust Hill, where we show up and we meet friends and you know we have some business contacts and we have a meal and play a round of golf once in a while, if that's all church is, and that's the only way that you look at this and treat this, we will be an abysmal failure as a church. That's not what churches are. Churches are not social clubs. Churches are the representative or representatives of the body of Christ on earth. We have a much higher calling than Oak Hill Country Club or Locust Hill or the Rotary or any club, the Boy Scouts or the YMCA, any club, group, or organization that you might belong to. We're dealing with people. We're dealing with the souls, the eternal souls of men and women and boys and girls. They're going to spend an eternity somewhere and have an opportunity to live an abundant life here or mess up the one life you get and have a miserable life on earth. I'm going to pray in just a second. I want to dismiss the young people right now. Thank you for staying and listening to everything I said. I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles to the book of James, and I'll bring my message this morning to you. James chapter number 4. James, it's toward the end of the New Testament, certainly toward the end of the Bible, for those of you who are new. It's after the book of Hebrews. James is only five chapters. It's a small book. But today I want to talk about in the fourth message in this series of looking up. I want to talk about the subject of prayer and how does this all fit in. We're going to talk about prayer today. What does it mean? Here's a word that was on each of the four bulletins from each Sunday, the messages that I've preached. And you can see the last word, pray, is the word that's on the cover of your bulletin this morning. These are four messages that have been crafted and prepared with the intent of making us more vertically aware as a church and ultimately to be more of a worshiping church than ever before. The first message was on the presence of God. We noted that God wants to manifest his presence and will manifest his presence in the midst of people who diligently seek him, whose hearts are perfect toward him, 2 Chronicles chapter 16, I think it was verse 9 said. So we talked about the presence of God, having the presence of God in our church. We noted that we have uh, the presence of God is in each believer. I'm a temple of the Holy Ghost. We know that wherever two or three are gathered together, that, there's, that the Lord is with. There's a special presence there. We know that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28 
that he was going to leave, but lo, I'll be with you always, even in, to the end of the age, even into the, to, uh, uh, the, in, until the time that we would be uh, off this earth, he would be with us. So there's several passages of Scripture that talk about the presence of God. But 2 Chronicles 16 says that God looks to act in a positive way to people whose hearts are perfect toward him. He's looking for people to bless. But there's a qualification for that blessing, and that is having a perfect heart toward God. The second message was on worship. We use the word adore, just to kind of get your attention. We are to worship God in spirit and in truth. When we come to church, we should be prepared to worship. We should be prepared to seek a special presence or demonstration of God in our church services. That doesn't happen randomly or accidentally. It happens when God's people come prepared to worship God and worship God with a pure heart. So we talked about the subject of worship being part of being vertical. Then we talked about, and we used the word speak. We went to 1 Corinthians chapters 1 and 2, and we said when we're referring to speak, what we need to do is when we come to this pulpit, we must preach Christ crucif crucified. The message has to be about Jesus. He has to be the, the main attraction at First Bible Baptist Church. We're not here to give psychological counseling. We're not here to uplift any human personality. We're not here to uplift an organization or some cause, even though the cause may be good. The number one thing is we speak about Jesus Christ. In the end, he is the answer to all the questions. He is the answer to the ultimate problems of mankind, Jesus Christ. When we speak of Jesus, it brings the glory of God down into the local church, emphasizing, glorifying, uplifting, and as Colossians chapter 1 says, giving Jesus Christ the preeminent place in the local church. So we want to celebrate his presence. He's looking for people to bless. We want to come together and worship God, truly worship God. That means he's worth it. When we come to the pulpit, we want to speak of Jesus Christ. He's the ultimate answer to the problems and the questions. And today we want to talk about the subject of prayer. Now, Father, we come to you this morning and ask your help. As we read Scripture, we ask that the Holy Spirit of God would enlighten us speak to each of us personally, and Lord, impact us to be vertical worshipers, vertical Christians, people who give Jesus the preeminent place in our thoughts, in our heart, in our actions, in all the priorities of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray these things, amen. Now in James chapter 4, from whence come wars and fightings among you. Come they not hence, even of your lusts that war in your members. Ye lust and ye have not, ye kill and desire to have, and cannot obtain. Ye fight in war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be afraid of the, be a, excuse me, be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Now let me stop right there to make a comment. I had someone email me and ask me a question, and I responded to her in a similar way that I will right now to you. She, was, she asked me, in fact, she doesn't attend here. She watches our sermons on the internet. I think she lives in Arizona. But she said, Pastor Grace, you didn't address the, uh, the uh, killings in Connecticut in your sermon on Sunday, the Sunday after that. 
Are you going to do that? I was looking for you to do that. In fact, she said, I looked at some other websites, some other pastors, and no pastor, Charles Stanley or some other people that she looked at, nobody else did either. Are you going to, or what do you think about this? I think what happened here in Webster this past week, what happened there, what happened in a movie theater in Colorado, another school in Colorado, and all those things, what do I think of them? And, I mean... We can sit around and we can discuss, you know, was this person mentally imbalanced? Uh, should we get rid of the guns or put more constraint on guns? Should we build walls around our schools and put police officers in them? What, what can we do to stop those things? As a pastor, let me just say, the problem is sin. The problem is sin. That is the root of all of this. Now, I know for you, you're saying, well, what problem is that going to solve? Well, if people would recognize that they're sinners and confess their sin and seek God's forgiveness for their sin and they get right with God, it probably would be, do an awful lot to end the kinds of things that have happened. I'm not looking for a simple solution. I'm looking for the real solution. Everything else is going to be a Band-Aid. You can build walls around schools. By the way, the school in Connecticut had a wonderful security system, and somebody let the guy into the school. So it's only as good as the people that are there anyway. And uh, there's a saying, I think all of you have heard this at one time or another, that locks are made for honest people. A criminal, and the reason why they're criminals and very successful, is they found a way to get by whatever security is that you've placed on your home, your car, your school, your church. They found a way to get around it and accomplish what they want to do. Now, why did they do that? Because of sin. I don't have, I don't have the ultimate solution to the problem. Uh, I can sit and talk about all the various aspects of what we should do about this, that, and the other thing. But it's not going to stop until the peacemaker comes, until Jesus Christ himself comes and there is peace on earth. Things like this are going to happen. Now, I'm not saying that because I'm negative and because I, 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 you know, I don't have hope for this world. In its present condition, I don't have hope for this world. When Christ comes... And he will, and we celebrated that last week in the Lord's Supper, he will be the solution to the kinds of things that we're talking about here. Should we do things to try to minimize, mitigate the problems? Of course we should. Should we sit around and find better ways to protect ourselves? I'm not against that at all, and I think we should. But the bottom line problem is we are sinners. And there's always going to be, unfortunately, people out there who are sinners and have wicked hearts and they don't care about other people. They don't care about God. They don't care about anyone. I'll leave that there. That is my sermon on all of that. It probably deserves one much longer, but I'm talking about something, honestly, that I think is even more important than that, and that is our prayer lives as God's people. Verse 5 says, Do you think that the Scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil. He'll flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he'll draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he'll lift you up. Now you have probably have read that passage numerous times. Some of you maybe many, many times. I don't know if you've ever looked at this as a passage on prayer, but surely it is. If you go back up to verse number 3, notice it says, Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss. So the passage certainly is dealing with the subject of prayer. When he says in verse 7, to submit yourself to God, that's prayer. In verse number 8, draw nigh to God, we do 
in prayer and he will draw nigh to you. Verse number 10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. He'll lift you up when you humble yourself. I've been preaching on Wednesday nights on the subject of prayer. I think I've spoken about seven, eight, maybe nine messages since uh, early October on Wednesday evenings on prayer. At about eight o'clock or thereabouts, we break after the message, after some praise and some worship and a message on prayer. Then we go to pray for the rest of the service, and we've done that for several weeks. And I want to invite you to come. You want to come to a prayer meeting? Every Wednesday night at eight o'clock, we have a prayer meeting for about 20 minutes at First Bible Baptist. If you can't make the church service, but you could make the prayer time, we would love to have you. But I said this a couple weeks ago. I said, I think the greatest or the, 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 the most prominent reason why we do not pray is that we are so self-sufficient and self-dependent. We don't feel like we need that much. Or maybe we don't feel like we need anything at all. It isn't until some kind of an emergency comes into our lives and we've exhausted all of our means to try to solve that problem that we come to the place and we say, you know, I think it's time to pray. And it's unfortunate that it's the last thing that many of us think to do rather than the first thing that we think to do. In fact, by the way, the Bible doesn't say that the only time you need to pray is when you find yourself helpless, helplessly in some kind of trouble. In fact, far from that. Prayer is a much-mentioned uh, subject in Scripture. There's 66 books in the Bible, and 62 of them either have prayers or talk about prayer. So it must be pretty important. There's a lot of other subjects in, that you and I do think uh, are important that aren't in, contained in that many books or that great of a percentage uh, of all of the books in the Word of God. James MacDonald in his book, which I've read a couple times now on Vertical Church, says this, and I'll put the quote on the screen for you here. If I'm going in the right direction, I'm going in the wrong direction, forgive me. Uh, Go back there. I just messed it up. I, hit, I had it upside down. I'm going in the wrong direction. We're going backwards in my uh, presentation here. There we go. This is what I'm looking for. McDonald says that fervent, faith-filled, persistent prayer is a prerequisite to God's manifest presence in church. In other words, to the degree that we are successful in our prayer lives, to the same degree we are going to be a vertical church and we are going to experience the manifest presence of God in our church. So if church services sometimes seem a little bit maybe less or dull to you than others, maybe it's your fault. Maybe it's not the preacher's fault. Maybe it's not the worship leader or the worship band's fault. Maybe it's your fault because we fail right here. Fervent, faith-filled, persistent prayer is a prerequisite to God's manifest presence in a church. And I think all of us would like to sense or experience that when we come to church, that it is an unusual and a unique occasion. That the things that happen when we are together as a body and worshiping God, that there's something truly very good and very special about it, and that God is truly involved in it. But according to McDonald, in his book, Vertical Church, he says, prayer is, an, is absolutely essential. I have another uh, quotation here that I'll uh, use in a little bit from Ravi Zacharias, but I read this and wrote it down, and I thought it would be good for discussing the limitations, how we limit ourselves in prayer. No believer's spiritual life will rise to stay above the level of his praying. Think about that. 
Your spiritual life has everything to do with your successful or unsuccessful prayer life. Again, as Americans, I think this is part of our American heritage and culture, which is not a good thing. You know, that pioneering spirit that we can do anything, it kind of spills over into becoming a little bit arrogant in our prayer life. It's kind of like we don't really need God that much. We can do just about anything we want to do if we put our minds to it. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing in John chapter 15 in verse number 5. So no believer's spiritual life will rise to stay above the level of his praying. And no church's ultimate effectiveness will rise to stay above the level of its corporate prayer life. It's corporate prayer life. Now this is, not, this is something, I'm just going to be honest with you, that we're not big on people. Okay? I said we. I'm including myself in here. We're not big on corporate prayer life. I didn't say that you don't pray. I said we as a group don't get together often as a church to pray. Okay? That's what I'm saying. Now, to get everybody together at one time is nigh impossible. I'm going to say it's possible, but it's pretty close to impossible for sure. But uh, I can give you some times. I know there's different times that people pray around here, but let me do this. For those of you that are involved in the life groups, I want to really emphasize that we need to make prayer a central part of our life groups. If we do, we've got 500 to 700 people, adults, involved in serious prayer. I don't mean the kind of prayer you pray over a meal and you take 30 seconds to ask God's blessing or to take the curse off whatever the cook did to your food. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about getting together in a, in a life group, a home cottage prayer meeting, however you want to look at it, and sincerely seeking God in prayer. If we could do that in our life groups and do it in the other places that we already do it, I think that it will make a huge difference at First Bible Baptist Church. Granted, to get everybody together in here is almost impossible. But I'm not sure that we have to have everybody in one room. But if I've got 20 of you in my home, or I'm in your home, and we get together and we spend a good prayer season, a good time, 20 minutes, 25 minutes in prayer together as a group, I think that it will change our church positively to make us much more vertical. No church's ultimate effectiveness will rise to stay above the level of its corporate prayer life, and no church's corporate prayer life will be greater than the personal prayer lives of those who make up its constituency. So, we can't wait till we show up for a life group on Tuesday night or Friday night. We need to begin to cultivate our own personal, regular prayer lives. But then again, I don't need anything from God. So why should I pray? Well, we don't just pray when we need something from God. We pray to praise God. I preached on this a couple times in the last uh, couple years on the, uh, the Our Father, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That prayer, which is so well known, starts out with praise and glory to God. That's very much a part of prayer. It's just praising God and thanking God for who he is. By the way, you could come to the end of a prayer, put an amen on the end of it, and never ask God to do anything for you, and it would be a prayer. Do you understand that? Really? Yeah. You can pray without asking God to do something for you. You can just pray and bless God. You can praise God. Or you could pray maybe for someone else and not for yourself. Someone else's needs. There are always needs. If you're on our, our internet um, uh, prayer list that Don Curran puts out, 
There are prayer requests every day that you can pray for. We have a prayer sheet that we put out every month. It's fresh. It always has 75 to 100 requests on there. You know people, you know enough people that have got their own issues they're dealing with. You can make up and you should make up your own prayer list. There's always plenty to pray about. It's not like you just can't think of anything right now. But if we want to do it intentionally and we make it important, we make prayer a matter of importance, it will, it will turn our church, I believe, upside down. Of the four things that we're talking about here, this is the fourth and equally as important as any of the others. Well, let me talk to you about myself here for just a moment, okay? Oh, well, no, that's my last name, but I'm going to talk about the grace of God. This is a quote from a writer, and I haven't heard of him in years, but I read some of his books probably 25 years ago. He's a pastor named Jack Taylor, and he wrote this. If grace is the river, prayer is the riverbed through which it flows. If grace is the water of life, prayer is the pipeline through which it comes. If grace is the content, prayer is the container from which it is poured. That being true, we cannot separate grace and prayer. To speak of one is to speak of the other, for we cannot know grace apart from prayer. Boy, I, you know, I haven't read that in a long time, but as I prepared for this message, I went back through a lot of my old messages. I've got about 100 pages of the sermons just on the subject of prayer over the years. And this was one of the quotes that, that really grabbed a hold of me because I know that we all want to live in the favor of God, do we not? Don't you want to live your life as an object of the grace or the unmerited favor of God? That's what salvation is all about. Well, if Taylor is right in what he says, then prayer is the means to bring God's favor and grace into our lives. Grace. We need to be persistent. The question for many of us is not, will God answer our prayers, but do we have faith to petition him persistently? If there is one thing that I learned from 1039 is I learned finally at 65, 66 years, I learned to be persistent in prayer. There's a group of about 20 people, probably 12 to 15 would show up every week on Thursday morning, and we met for three years in eight months, almost every Thursday morning. You know, every now and then someone would miss here or there, including myself. But there was a core of people, about 20 people, that met regularly to pray specifically for the sale of 1039. And you might say, well, you people didn't really have all that good of a prayer life. Look how long it took for it to happen. But all things work together for good to them that love God. There were a lot of times when I came out here on Thursday mornings at 6.15 or 6.30 and I thought we're going to go to prayer again, particularly as we got a year, uh, 15, 18 months into this. I thought, is this really, humanly speaking, is this really doing any good? Did you ever feel that way when you prayed? <laughs> Am I the only one that feels that way? Now I knew theoretically that it was the right thing to do. But practically speaking, I know I'm the only one that's like this, but practically speaking, there's times when I have my doubts. Am I the only one that does that? Am I the only one? Sometimes, you know, you wonder, is this really what I need to be doing? Does God really hear and answer prayer? I'm admitting that to you. I, I'm not embarrassed by that. I'm a human being. But I can always go back to that book right there, and it reminds me it's the Word of God, the promises of God. The Bible says, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God that passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. That's probably my favorite verse. 
And it's a verse on prayer. And I'm not a real good prayer warrior, I can tell you that. But it's probably my favorite verse in all of the Bible. Thanksgiving and prayer and the peace of God keeping your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I learned praying for 1039. If there was one reason why God postponed the sale of that building, <laughs> it's me. George needed to learn persistence, to get up on Thursday morning early with a specific intention of praying for the sale of that building. And I believed, most of the time, that someday it would happen. There were times when I really wondered, I want you to know that, but guess what? <laughs> it's gone. You know what? It's like I've gone through surgery. People ask me, they say, how do you feel about it? I feel like I had surgery. I'm improving every day. I get better every single day. And today is better than yesterday. But you know what? I had to go through all of that, and you've been through things like that, to get where you are today. To trust God even when it seems like nobody's listening, that God isn't listening persistence in prayer. There's a lot about that in the Bible. If you want to study the subject, you could go to the uh, uh, Gospel of Luke, and you could find a couple good parables on that subject. The reason why God responds to persistence is because prayer is changing the one who prays. It's changing me. Prayer changes us into the people who can participate in the greater work of God without being spoiled by it through pride or becoming discouraged by the increased weight of greater faithfulness. If you want to be stronger, you have to go through some measure of pain, loss, or suffering. It's true in every area of life. You want to be a good student and get an education? Pay. Not only pay here, but you're going to stay up, you're going to study, you're going to read, you're going to work, you're going to be held accountable for examinations, and it's going to be a struggle. You don't get a college degree or a master's degree by sitting around watching television and eating bonbons. You have to work. You have to suffer to accomplish something. It's true in every area of life. It's true in the area of sports. You want to get stronger? You have to submit yourself to a weight or a resistance. You have to try to pick up something that you have to struggle with or do something that isn't easy. You don't just get up one morning and say, I think I'll run a marathon today. You won't do that. You'd be a rare individual that could do, it takes pain and suffering to get to the place where you're able to do that. And the same thing is true in, this, in your spiritual life. You want to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I hate to be the one to announce this to you if you've never heard it before, but you're going to have to go through some pain some suffering, some disappointment, and some inconvenience to get there. Life and everything isn't just going to go perfect for you. You want to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. There will be a price to pay. And there is a regimen for everyone. God will put you through what you need to go through to make you the person he wants you to be. Remember, it's not over here. It's over there is next. God is preparing us for all of eternity, and he wants to use us here. And to use you to your fullest potential, you must get strong spiritually. You must grow spiritually. You must be willing to face the pressures, the stress, the pain, the inconvenience, the disappointment. I'm sorry to have to tell you that, but that's real life, people. That's real life. And when it comes, when a difficult challenge comes or a disappointment comes to you, 
you need to go to the Lord in prayer. You don't pray last. You pray first, and you say, Lord, what are you going to show me through this? How can I be stronger? How can I draw closer to you? How can I become more like you through this trial, through this tribulation, through this suffering, through this disappointment? How can I become more like you? What are you doing in me? Submit yourself. You see the text there? Submit, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Well, let me wrap this up. Let me wrap this up with these thoughts. Can you read that from where you are? Can you? I can from here. Of course, I'm a lot closer. I can barely read it on the back screen. But here's several things that are all compressed together in prayer. Uh, sometimes we think, well, I just have to kind of go, okay, Lord, I got a problem. I want you to know I got a problem. Help me. And that's not a bad prayer. But there's more to prayer, and James tells us. I'm just going to sum up what we've read already here in these thoughts. In prayer, first of all, we must, and this is difficult, relinquish control of your life. You must submit yourself and humble yourself to God. And I fear that's where many of us break down immediately. We can't do that. We want to keep control. We want to keep charge of our lives. Secondly, we need to resist satanic influence. Sometimes we're not sure what that is, but we need to be open. There's enough in the Bible about the devil to believe that he's real and that he does want to destroy you and he wants to have a negative or sinful influence on your life. You need to prepare yourself for spiritual warfare. Thirdly, you need to restore worship to a priority in your life. They go together. When we're talking about the presence of God and worship, and we're talking about speaking the gospel and lifting Christ up in our presence, in our church, and praying to God corporately, we have to remember worship must be a priority. We've got to renounce our own sinful actions. That's repentance. I'm wrong. I'm sorry. That's part of praying. Renouncing my failures, disappointing God, having the wrong attitude, doing the wrong things before the Lord. And then sometimes it's not just actions. It's just a lousy attitude, isn't it? It's an attitude. Attitudes lead to actions. The actions become a result of bad attitudes. But sometimes it's just, I got a bad attitude and I got to deal with it. I've had to do that myself, I can't tell you, countless times in my life. You think I always want to come to church? <laughs> now, I like church, and I like most of you. I probably like all of you, all right? But there are times when I don't want to be here. Is that okay? Can I be human? There's a lot of times I do what I do because it's my responsibility to do it. Now, there's a lot of times I do what I do because I really enjoy it. But there are things that I don't enjoy, and sometimes there's things that I do enjoy that they even become work and I don't want to do them. I have to deal with my attitude. I found out this, that when I have a bad attitude, just kind of suppress it as much as you can. Do what you're supposed to do, and I watch my attitude change once I get involved and engaged. My attitude changes, and I get right by doing it. React to sin and sorrow, part of repentance. Refrain from frivolous attitudes towards evil. Fri sin isn't funny. No kind of sin is funny. The damage it does to individuals, the damage it does to families, it's not funny. Respond humbly to success. Be humble with your successes. You don't have to wave a flag in the text. It talks about tooting your own horn. Blowing a trumpet is what is said in James there. You don't have to toot your own horn. And then the last thing is refuse to slander your brother. Why would we do that? Let me tell you why we do that. Because if I can make you look lower, that makes me look higher. 
I can, I can have a greater opinion of myself if I can have a lower opinion of all you. If I can come in here and say, you know, it's a bunch of nerds at First Bible Baptist Church. They're a bunch of, you know, weirdos and jerks. That, if I can think of you like that as a group, then I can say, and of course I'm an exception to that, I'm superior, you are inferior. Again, it's a humility thing. When we're talking about prayer, you could look at every one of these things and you could connect your attitude towards yourself to each one of them. Humility. What is the biggest deterrent to prayer? I don't need God. I am self-sufficient. I can do it myself. I'll call on him when I've exhausted every other means to accomplish what needs to be done. Then I'll pray. That's wrong. We should pray first. We should pray first, not last. Humble yourself in the sight of God. He'll lift you up. Jesus said in John chapter 15, I'm the vine, you're the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. It's all about Jesus, the presence of Jesus, the worship of Jesus, speaking about Jesus, and prayer is all about calling upon the Lord and worshiping him and seeking his aid in help. For without me, he said, ye can do nothing. Prayer is simply talking to God, and in doing so, we come to him in reverence, adoration, and total dependence. That's the hard part. Total dependence upon God. As a church, FBBC needs to take the privilege and the responsibility of prayer much more seriously. All of our efforts will ultimately re be reduced to wood, hay, and stubble without a great effort in our prayer lives as a church. We can be better. We can do better. We need to think about this individually, corporately, collectively as a church. Many of you know Ravi Zacharias. I love to read his books. I love to listen to him. I've heard him speak many times. In fact, my wife and I will go to... Uh, Camp of the Woods this summer. We already have our reservations to go up there. He's going to be a guest speaker there again. I like to listen to him. He's a brilliant man, and he always has great insights into any subject that he addresses. He said, I don't believe, put yourself in this, make this first person, I will. I do not believe that one can earnestly seek and find the priceless treasure of God's call without a devout prayer life. That's where God speaks. The purpose of prayer and of God's call in your life is not to make you number one in the world's eyes, but to make him number one in your life. That's what prayer is all about, to make him number one. He is the first person we go to, not the last. He has the preeminent place in our life. He is not at the bottom of the list. He is the one that hears from us first. First thing in the morning, first when we find ourselves in need and a problem, first when we want to praise or thank somebody or anybody for anything, he is the first one that we need to think of. For fervent, faith-filled, persistent prayer is a prerequisite to God's manifest presence in the church. Let's put it all together, people. We're looking at a new year. Let's seek the presence of God, have a perfect heart toward him, that God's presence would be among us in our church services, that we would come prepared on Sunday morning, or whenever we come, we would come to worship God, prepared to worship not wait 10, 15 minutes into the sermon or 10, 15 minutes into the music. We're going to come here and we're going to speak about Jesus. It's all about Jesus Christ. And we're going to have a biblical prayer life 
where we come to him or we go to him first, first. And without this kind of prayer life, you can do nothing. All of our efforts, our vision, all of our Bible studies, all of our Sunday school classes, our athletic ministries, all of the things we do in education, they'll come to naught if we aren't on our knees seeking the blessing of God in our church and in our lives. Father, I come to you this morning and I ask you to help us today. As the pastor of this church, I'm making an appeal to this church to take seriously the words that have spoken this morning. I haven't attempted to make an emotional appeal, I'm making an appeal based on the word of God, and I think to most in this room, common sense. Help us now, Lord, to be a praying church, a vertical church in every way, and we look forward to 2013 to be a great year that our church will go forward. It's a